speaker today is Dr. David Inouye. He sits on the governing boards of the Ecological Society of America, the North American Pollinator Protection Campaign, the USA National Phenology Network, and he's a member of the National Academy of Sciences Roundtable on Public Information in the Life Sciences. He also serves on numerous scientific publication editorial boards. He's a professor emeritus at the Department of Biology at the University of Maryland, where he taught classes in ecology and conservation biology. Lastly, Dr. Inouye is, the lead, is a lead author for the IPBBS Fast Track Assessment of Pollinators, Pollination, and Food Production. And at this moment, he's at his home looking out his window at the beautiful, majestic Rocky Mountains. And so he's going to tell you a little bit about the uh, work that he's doing there at his laboratory. We're so grateful to have him here at our first joint webinar of B City USA and B Campus USA affiliates. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Inouye, for being with us. Maybe that's working now. I just got word that the line had been unmuted. Okay. So Phyllis has shown everybody or told everybody what the agenda is. And what she had asked me to do was to present to you a, a talk that I put together for the annual meeting the North American Pollinator Protection Campaign, which was held in Washington, D.C. in October. And at that meeting, I talked about the report that I helped to uh, present on pollinators, pollination, and food production. I thought uh, I'd try to do that in a context of another talk I had also given recently about how biological collections and field studies of pollinators can foster food security. And since this is a uh, an audio only link, I thought I'd show you a picture of me and where I work. This is a picture taken near the Rocky Mountain Biological Laboratory, which is up at 9,500 feet on the western slope of the Colorado Rocky Mountains. And this is a, a view of the East River Valley showing the Rocky Mountain Biological Lab, which is about uh, eight miles outside the town of Crested Butte. And of course, this time of year, it looks quite different with uh, snow covering everything. But during the summer, it's a very busy place with a, about 160 people in residence, including uh, faculty and graduate students and postdocs who come from all over the country and uh, sometimes from overseas, and also uh, undergraduate students from schools all around the country. This is a, a composite picture showing some of the wildflowers that are at that research site and uh, some of the pollinators I work with too. I do work with hummingbirds. Uh, I do work with uh, bumblebees, uh, with, work with uh, butterflies. And um, I've worked there since uh, uh, I started taking some classes as an undergraduate in 1971. So I've now spent about 46 years working at this research station. Some of the work that we're doing now involves uh, the broad-tailed hummingbirds. This is a resident species of hummingbird that breeds in the Colorado Rocky Mountains but flies back down to Mexico or maybe even as far south as Guatemala where they are this time of year. Uh, this is a male of that species and you can see it's got a nice dusting of pollen on the underside of its uh, chin. Uh, from some of the flowers that it's been visiting. And I do a lot of work with different species of wildflowers, uh, in part looking at how the timing of flowering and the abundance of flowers changing over time. And this will give you an idea of how abundant some of these flowers can be. This is a, uh, a flower, the common name of which is Aspen sunflower. And uh, the um, uh, 
her scientific name is Helium Della Quinquinervis. And as in some years, it just fills meadows like this in July, but in other years, uh, the same meadow at the same time of year will look like this because there's been an event earlier in the summer where frost uh, killed all of the developing buds, and therefore there were no flowers. You can perhaps imagine this also causes problems for um, for the pollinators, which no longer have that as a, a floral resource. Okay, I'm going to a little bit louder or, or increase the volume. And hopefully that'll uh, that'll make this a little bit easier for you to hear. So uh, this is a graph that shows why in some years there are lots of those uh, aspen sunflowers and why in other years there are none. Uh, the upper left insert picture shows a frost killed bud and the lower right insert picture shows what the normal wildflower looks like uh, and down at the bottom uh, are the uh, day of the year when the snow melted at this research station uh, so in years in which there's early snow melt uh, with those blue data points there are very few flowers and what happens is that uh, uh, they the buds got frosted in years where the snow melt is delayed much later then it's possible for the plants to go ahead and develop those buds and have large numbers of flowers so as the climate is changing what we're seeing is that the snow is melting earlier and we're seeing more commonly these these frost events which then have consequences uh, not only the flower but also for the pollinators that would like to visit them uh, most of the bees, but also some flies, and also flies that are seed predators and are trying to visit those flowers uh, in order to to uh, lay their eggs. They're not able to uh, to find flowers to lay their eggs in that year, and their populations will decline. This is a graph that shows the numbers of those flowers that I counted every year since 19. Let's see, I guess that's 1974. And I, if you look at that uh, sort of with a broad brush, it looks like there may be about a 10 or 11 year cycle of flowering. But within those cycles, there are still years where there are essentially no flowers because of the uh, frost damage. That this graph shows one reason why it's important to uh, to do long term site in order to take a look at the variation that's. Uh, that's happening from year to year and perhaps on decadal cycles as well. In terms of how climate change is affecting pollinator populations, uh, here's a figure that shows uh, one of the trails in the East River Valley. This is a trail that in 1974 uh, and 75, a couple of us who were graduate students back at that point uh, would hike up that trail and keep track of what flowers we saw in bloom and what bees we saw along that transect. And we repeated that transect again in 2007 and then again a couple of years ago. And what we found is that bumblebees seem to be moving up in altitude, uh, probably or presumably uh, so that they can remain within their climatic comfort zones. Um, what's gonna happen to the, the bumblebee species that were already at the higher altitudes as these mid elevation bumblebees move up in, in altitude is a question that is still at this point unanswered. So let me move uh, on from having told you a little bit about what I do uh, and talk more generally about um, the ecosystem service of pollination, how important that is, and what we know about the status of, of bees around the world now. So this is a picture that was put out a, a couple of years ago by uh, Whole Foods and the Xerces Society showing what the grocery stores would look like if there were not uh, uh, any pollination going on. And you can see that a number of uh, fruits and vegetables uh, have disappeared. Uh, the pollinators are uh, uh, not providing those that service. So uh, it's pretty well documented uh, that pollinators are a critical link in the food system. Uh, 
and uh, outside uh, what we eat, also a lot of uh, other biodiversity, including about 85% of all of the plant species on Earth uh, require pollinators in order to reproduce. And in terms of the food that we eat from that subset of plants that we rely on, about one out of every three bites of food that we eat um, from about three-fourths of all of our crops are dependent upon uh, pollinators. Ec economists have tried to put a value on this, uh, and these are uh, estimates with a wide range of variants on them because uh, uh, we don't have a lot of hard data, but that total value of pollination worldwide is estimated to be perhaps as much as about $500 billion a year um, or about 10% of world agricultural production that's used for, for human food. Uh, beyond just uh, the presence or absence of, of uh, foods pollinated by pollinators, uh, it turns out that there's a, a qualitative aspect to this too, uh, so that crops that receive more pollen from pollinators are likely to look better, taste better, and have a longer shelf life than the ones that don't receive sufficient pollen. This uh, uh, potential problem of not having enough pollination service is perhaps being exacerbated because over the last five decades, there's actually been an increase in 300% of uh, the production of pollinator-dependent crops. And so that makes the pollinator, uh, or the uh, farmers or the orchard growers around the world whose livelihoods depend on provision of pollination, uh, perhaps that much more tenuous. Crop plants that depend on pollinators also produce a lot of vitamins, including 90% of the vitamin C that we consume, uh, almost all of the essential uh, amino acids, um, and uh, also a lot of important antioxidants are produced in the fruits and vegetables that are the, con the result of pollination. Uh, vitamin A is an example that's been uh, studied well. About half of all of the production of plant-derived sources of vitamin A requires pollination, and that's not just in the United States, that's throughout the world, including uh, Southeast Asia, uh, whereas other essential micronutrients like iron and folate have lower dependencies, and those uh, plants that produce those are scattered throughout Africa, Asia, and Central America. So it turns out that micronutrient deficiencies are three times as likely to occur in areas that have that highest pollination dependence for vitamin A and iron, and that suggests that disruptions in pollination could have serious implications for the accessibility of those micronutrients for public health. Uh, the, the inset photo here shows a bee, which is, as you can see, very well covered with pollen grains, and therefore, therefore it's probably doing a pretty good job of pollinating those plants that it's visiting. So dietary changes from loss of pollinators could increase uh, global death rates from non-communicable and malnutrition-related diseases uh, by as much as uh, 1.4 million per year. And uh, there's another statistic that's sometimes used called disability-adjusted life years uh, that could be um, negatively affected by as much as 27 million people per year. And just losing half of pollination services would still uh, be pretty significant because it might re uh, generate as many as 700,000 additional annual deaths and 13.2 million of those disability-adjusted life years. One of the things that, uh, that scientists are finding, and that information is being communicated to the the general public as well, is that we're seeing some alarming declines in populations of many pollinator species, not just uh, honeybees, which receive the most attention, but also a lot of wild uh, species of pollinators and uh, unmanaged uh, and managed pollinators. So an organization called the International Union for Conservation of Nature uh, produces uh, a, what they call a red list to assess uh, species that are threatened or endangered. And they're Assessments indicate that 16.5% uh, of vertebrate pollinators, so that would include hummingbirds, it would include sunbirds, it would include bats, um, and some other small mammal pollinators, are threatened with global extinction. The situation is even worse uh, for, for island species. 
uh, where extinction is much more of a potential problem. Uh, there aren't any global red list assessments specific for your insect pollinators, uh, but there are some regional or national assessments that have indicated high levels of threat for some bees and also for some butterfly species. So there, there are a, have been a number of international efforts to try and protect pollinators. Uh, this has included, um, let's see, let me go back here. This is included in 2000, the fifth conference of parties of the Convention on Biological Diversity. Uh, what they did was, was establish an international initiative for the conservation and sustainable use of pollinators. And the objectives of this uh, uh, convention um, is, are to include uh, promotion of conservation restoration, sustainable use of pollinator diversity in agriculture and also in related ecosystems. Uh, in order to accomplish this, we need assessment of pollinator populations, adaptive management for those populations, capacity building to train people in order to do that assessment and management work, and also trying to make, this, uh, make these mainstream practices in agriculture worldwide. In 2008, there was a, a UN Food and Agricultural Organization workshop, um, and they tried to put emphasis on what's called a crop pollination deficit to refer to quantitative or qualitative uh, measurements of pollen receipt and because that could limit agricultural output or yield in economic terms. The way that uh, we assess uh, uh, pollination deficit is to look at the number of pollen grains of the appropriate species that are being deposited on the stigmas of receptive flowers. And so typically you'll need a microscope to do that work uh, and then following up on that, try and quantify what is the fruit set or what is the seed set resulting from having that pollen deposited on the stigmas. And you can also uh, try to measure pollinator visitation to see are the plants uh, of interest receiving visits by pollinators in order to deposit that pollen. Uh, the Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services was established by the uh, United Nations as a way of trying to get a handle on what, what the potential problems are biodiversity and ecosystem services that they provide uh, facing around the world. And its first uh, assessment is, was one called Thematic Assessment of Pollinators, Pollination, and Food Production. And so this intergovernmental platform uh, is an international effort involving some 200 countries around the world. And they're trying to provide knowledge that's relevant for policymakers about biodiversity and ecosystem services uh, so that those policymakers can make informed decisions about how to protect um, that biodiversity and the ecosystem services that it provides. So it was established in, in 2012, uh, where there were 124 original members. Uh, there's a larger number now. The functions of that group are to generate knowledge, figure out what knowledge do policymakers need, and to catalyze the efforts to generate that new knowledge. Uh, an assessment uh, of global, regional, and thematic uh, uh, issues related to biodiversity and then to catalyze support for uh, various regional assessments to provide policy support tools, how to identify uh, the tools, the methodologies that policymakers need to facilitate use of those tools and methodologies and to promote and catalyze development of, of uh, future policy support tools. And then the final goal is to prioritize key capacity building needs uh, in order to, to uh, promote this uh, biodiversity and ecosystem services, and then provide uh, and call for financial and other support for those priority needs. So this fast track thematics assessment about pollinators was to first look at pollination and pollinators associated with food production. Uh, they decided that this was a good topic for a first assessment effort uh, 
because there had been requests from member states for this information. Uh, it addresses an urgent problem uh, that we already were learning about of pollinator loss. It has high policy relevance because of its impact on food production, um, and it also has global relevance. And also the economic importance of food was another reason to pick uh, pollination for this initial assessment. And the fact that there's a significant amount of literature available made it seem realistic that an assessment like this could be carried out. As it turns out, there's also an important social and cultural component to, uh, to pollination. So the plenary, uh, the IPBS uh, plenary concluded that pollination services is a subject that already has significant amounts of suitable literature and country specific initiatives, but whose import impact is still limited by the lack of global policy uptake and implementation effort. So after 2015, um, there were a set of United Nations sponsored uh, sustainable development goals and uh, they try to focus on a, uh, among other things, biodiversity. So one of the goals of sustainable development is to protect, restore, and promote sustainable use of terrestrial ecosystems and to halt all biodiversity loss. And that hopes to underpin one of the goals, uh, other goals, which is to end hunger, achieve food security, and adequate nutrition, and promote sustainable agriculture. So in terms of what knowledge is available to address this issue of pollination and food security, uh, here's a graph showing the number of scientific publications uh, that relate to pollinators and pollination. And you can see that there's been a, or, or there is an ongoing uh, logistic growth in the number of scientific papers. So that uh, was a, uh, those are now a good resource. In terms of who's contributed to this uh, uh, assessment, this is a group of a uh, picture showing some of the 90 experts from areas all around the world that came together for a series of three meetings. Uh, the group was chaired by Simon Potts from the UK and Vera Fonseca from Brazil. Uh, there were a group of coordinating lead authors, a set of lead authors, uh, review editors, and a technical support coordinator. So there was uh, quite a substantial international group uh, working for a couple of years on this on this project. This is a map that shows where around the world these uh, participants came from. In 2014, uh, participants were selected in the USA. This was done by the Ecological Society of America. Um, there was an initial authors meeting in July 2014 in Germany, uh, followed by a series of external reviews of uh, what we came up with at that initial authors meeting. Then another authors meeting in Brazil and uh, uh, another round of external reviews, both by experts and by governments. Uh, for the chapter that I worked on, uh, which was chapter three, we had 550 comments from these external reviewers and governments that we had to address then in the next revision. And then uh, uh, last year in July, uh, there was a, a, the final authors meeting. Uh, we then produced the third draft uh, that went out for review again. Um, there's a final technical report that's been actually been issued now. Uh, there's a summary for policymakers trying to summarize the highlights of what we learned in terms of the science and come up with uh, ideas for those uh, policymakers that are thinking about ways to protect pollinators and the ecosystem service they provide. That's now available online. There are a diversity of values that were pointed to. Uh, economic values uh, were highlighted in this report, uh, pointing out that there's a, a very large uh, dollar or euro figure for the value of food production from pollinators globally. Uh, there is also a uh, human health is involved, as I mentioned earlier. Pollinator dependent crops supply a major proportion of the micronutrients that we need in our diet. We could also think about ecosystem health, the fact that about 90% of wild plants rely on pollinators, and they in turn support wider, wider biodiversity, including the pollinators that visit those plants, and including um, animals that eat the plants, uh, animals who uh, feed upon the seeds of those plants, and so on. 
There are also biocultural values, pollinators and uh, pollination uh, in art, literature, music, song, heritage, religion. Uh, they foster recreation, education, ornamental plants, landscapes, medicinal plants, uh, construction materials, biofuels, fibers, uh, industrial design, biomimicry, pharmacology. There's a, there's a long list of uh, biocultural values fostered by pollinators and pollination. Uh, what did we find in the way of trends? Um, there are recent papers coming out showing that uh, there are declines not only in pollinators, but also in insect pollinated plants in Britain and the Netherlands, where, where they were able to find historical data, uh, uh, go back and look at the same sites in more modern times and find that uh, both pollinators and the plants that they visit are, are declining in those parts of the world. Uh, another paper that focused on the Chicago, Illinois area published recently showed that uh, over the 120 year period since the initial survey was done, uh, there had been a loss of uh, plant species and pollinator species. Uh, uh, in this case, uh, for Northwestern European plants and pollinators, uh, another documentation just came uh, a couple of years ago showing that there are declines in both plants and pollinators. A lot of these comparisons of earlier work and later work have, have uh, taken place in Europe uh, where they had a, a better history of historical studies that they were able to then follow up on. We don't have quite that same uh, resource here in uh, North America, unfortunately. But here is a study that was carried out here in the United States looking at North American bumblebees. And unfortunately, when that was published uh, a few years ago, uh, they found that there seemed to be a widespread decline in North American bumblebees. And in fact, there is at least one and potentially two species of bumblebees that seem to have gone extinct here in the United States in the last uh, couple of years. So uh, in summary, declines in some bees in hoverflies, a kind of fly that uh, can also be an important pollinator, and also butterflies, uh, both in Europe and in North America, and some evidence in other regions where there is not as much ongoing work and there hasn't been as much historical work. Also for other taxa, including uh, vertebrate pollinators. Honeybees are the species of pollinator for which there's the most known. Um, and of course, uh, you're, you're all aware that they're not native here in North America, uh, but in many parts of the world, uh, there have been relatively high losses of honeybees noted in the last uh, decade or so. Uh, overall, globally managed hives have actually increased quite a bit. And area of pollinator dependent agriculture has increased uh, over 300% in the last, uh, I think that was five decades. Well, what are some of the drivers of change resulting in this uh, in these declines in pollinators around the world? Uh, loss of habitat, in particular for nesting, is a big problem. Uh, for instance, when you have a mass crop, let's say uh, hundreds of acres of, of soybeans, although they may benefit from pollinators, when you dig up that soil to plant or uh, after harvesting, you're destroying the habitat that ground nesting bees need for uh, to reproduce. Fragmentation of habitat, making smaller and smaller patches is also quite detrimental to pollinator populations. And degradation of habitat is, is also a problem for pollinators. Pathogens are a growing problem. There are a number of pathogens that have been moved around the world uh, by um, commercial beekeepers. That's true not only for honeybees, but it's also been shown to be true now for bumblebees and uh, for some other native bee species here in North America as well as other parts of the world. Uh, agrochemicals like uh, pesticides or herbicides uh, uh, are a well-known problem for pollinators. Climate change uh, is also resulting in a number of problems for pollinators, causing some of them to move up in latitude, to move up in, um, to move up in altitude, as I showed earlier. Invasive species, uh, as they're being moved around the world, either intentionally or unintentionally, are, are causing problems for, for native pollinators. Uh, and then interactions of all of these factors uh, uh, are often synergistic and cause huge problems for pollinator populations around the world. 
some of the outcomes of this IPBES or IPBES assessment uh, are the technical report, which is the evidence that is underpinning the summary for policymakers, uh, which is policy relevant but not prescriptive. So it suggests a number of uh, ideas that policymakers could institute to protect pollinators. Um, but that also may require capacity building in order to maximize the impact of these policies globally, regionally, and locally. Uh, a, a brief assessment outline, uh, we had an introductory, introductory chapter uh, reviewing the diversity of pollinators and pollination systems, how important they are in supporting food production and human well-being, and more generally, biodiversity maintenance. A chapter on the, what are the drivers of change of pollinators, uh, pollination networks, and pollination services, uh, especially those drivers that affect food production and local crops, wild food plants, and honey production. In chapter three, we looked at what do we know about the status and trends in pollinator populations, pollination networks, and pollination services, both in human managed and natural terrestrial ecosystems. Uh, fourth chapter focused specifically on economic and methodologies for determining the value of pollination for food production and how to measure the impact of decline in pollinator populations that are relevant to food production. Uh, chapter five, it was about non-economic non valuation. For instance, how do indigenous and local communities value pollinators and uh, the results of pollination, and also of the impacts of the decline of diversity uh, and uh, populations of pollinators. And the final chapter was uh, about responses to risks associated with the degradation of pollination services and opportunities that we have to restore and strengthen uh, those pollination services. There are a number of regional initiatives going on already. For instance, uh, the North American Pollinator Protection Campaign, which includes uh, work in both Canada, United States, and in Mexico. Uh, there's a similar sort of effort in Brazil, uh, one that's Africa-wide, uh, some that are uh, European Union-wide, also efforts in uh, um, Southeast Asia and in Australia in the Oceana Pollinator Initiative. So I think in conclusion, this IP best pollination assessment is a unique opportunity to enhance global policy and practice related to pollinators, pollination, and food production. Globally, we share many of the, the broad challenges that I've identified and the report identifies, and these will need locally developed solutions. Regional and national initiatives have a critical role to play in sharing the knowledge, in building the capacity, and supporting the development of, of better policies and practices. Uh, so this uh, summary for policymakers is now available online. Uh, there's a 36-page summary report that's available online, and also uh, the full report is available in a draft form online now. Uh, they're working on a, a better formatted uh, form. There have also now been some follow-on products. For instance, uh, a paper just published uh, this past in past month in Nature, uh, another one in Science, and those are two of the highest profile science uh, publications in the world. So that's, these are helping to, to draw attention to this issue of uh, protecting pollinators and their services. And I'll just put up a a slide showing uh, these 10 policies that are suggested for pollinators in the paper published in Science a week or two ago. Uh, they suggest raising pesticide regulatory standards as a way of protecting pollinators, uh, promoting integrated pest management, which would be one way to, to reduce pesticide use, include indirect and sublethal effects in uh, uh, genetically modified crop risk assessments, regulate the movement of managed pollinators. That's a way to help try and prevent the spread of diseases uh, around the world and also invasive pollinator species. Helping incentives such as uh, schemes that would help farmers benefit from ecosystem services instead of agrochemicals, uh, perhaps help them to reduce their reliance on agrochemicals and instead uh, rely on organic farming. Uh, but because that's a bit of a riskier issue, it might take a better insurance scheme to help protect those farmers. Uh, 
Number six, recognize pollination as an agricultural input in extension services is a way of providing information to the farmers and growers. Uh, support diversified farming systems because that diversity of resources uh, for pollinators is a good way to, to support their populations. Uh, for instance, that problem of only planting one crop and thousands of acres of it means that there's only that one species of flower available for food for pollinators, and uh, they typically would need food for the whole summer, not just for the flowering time of, of one crop. Number eight, uh, conserve and restore green infrastructure in agricultural and urban landscapes, uh, meaning a network of habitats that pollinators can move from one habitat to another. Uh, develop long-term monitoring of pollinators and pollination. Uh, that's one of the areas that we identified as uh, uh, not having enough information when we tried to uh, produce a, a state-of-the-art or, or report about the status of pollinators is just not having enough information about how are their populations doing from one year to the next. And the last one, fund participatory research on improving yields in organic, diversified, and ecologically intensified farming. So I think uh, as those policy recommendations get out to policymakers at the international, national, regional, and local levels, uh, there are a number of opportunities for uh, helping to protect and promote pollinator populations. Okay, I'll, I'll stop there um, and if I can figure out. Then I'm gonna um, just go to our last slide. Thank you so much, David, for that. In spite of all of our technical difficulties, you shouldered, soldiered on. And um, so we want everybody to know that they can get a recording of this webinar on our website once we, we post it. And we apologize again for our, our um, startup uh, efforts here with this new way of communicating with each other. In the last minutes that we have, David, I wonder um, if you could just speak to why the work that these B cities and B campuses are doing in raising awareness about how important pollinators are and uh, planting more native plants, especially native flowering plants, and using fewer, if any, pesticides. Uh, could you talk about why that matters uh, in these last few minutes? Yeah, I think uh, B campuses have an opportunity to help in at least two ways. Uh, one is to help those local bee populations or pollinator populations in general. And uh, at least for bees, uh, they can often disperse pretty long distances. And so if you have a, a bee campus that's producing excess bees, those bees are going to uh, try and disperse and help to colonize areas uh, over quite a, a good distance. Uh, the other important function that those bee campuses can serve is an educational function. So uh, helping to educate people in the area about the value of pollinators, the value of pollination, the fact that if they have more pollinators around, their backyard gardens are going to be more productive. Uh, so I think uh, right off the top of my head, I can uh, think of those two important functions that bee campuses can serve. And um, what about ornamental landscapes? We, we talk a lot with uh, from a UN perspective, we're worried about food security. And so a lot of people just think about agriculture when they think about the importance of pollination, but you spoke quite a bit about biodiversity and the uh, global food web. Could you elaborate on why even bringing um, diversity of all kinds of pollinators and plants into our ornamental landscapes contributes to overall global biodiversity and food security? Sure. Um, those uh, ornamentals can be a, a critical source of food, both, both pollen and nectar, for local pollinator populations. Uh, one thing I should say about ornamentals is that uh, some species of ornamental plants have been selected for particular traits, for instance, maybe pretty colors, but they may have lost along the way the ability to produce nectar uh, or to produce the, the, the scent cues that are important for attracting pollinators. For instance, a lot of the ornamental uh, varieties of roses have lost the, the rose smell that 
that you can still find very strongly in wild roses. Uh, and therefore, uh, that would be one reason they might not be as attractive to pollinators. Uh, so uh, your choice of ornamentals is another way that you can help to support pollinator populations. I saw a, a, an announcement just uh, today, actually, that the Xerces Society has just come out with a new publication about uh, ornamental plants. I think it was uh, 100 plants that you can plant to help support pollinator populations. I forget the exact title. But uh, there are now some, a growing number of resources for helping people to decide what ornamentals might be best to plant for supporting pollinator populations. Thank you, David. I'm, I'm aware that it's almost 4 o'clock, and I'm sure other people have other meetings to go to. But I want to thank everybody again. I want to especially thank the, uh, Dr. David Inouye for doing this for us. And uh, what a tremendous resource he is. Uh, around the world. And thank you all for what you're doing in your communities. Every single time you turn on that light bulb for somebody and help them understand how important pollinators are to keeping our, our world green and lush, uh, you're, you're just doing an amazing job with forwarding our cause. So thank you, and I hope you'll listen to the recording again. Uh, I'm going to say goodbye with that.